Okay, so today we're coming to the last of the I Am sayings in John's Gospel, the only one that runs to an additional assertion about anyone else. Because in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is saying, I am, we're used to that, but then he's saying, and. I am the true vine, my Father is the gardener. So all Jesus is saying today is stated in a relational context. It's not just about Jesus, it's about Jesus and his fundamental relationship with the Father. Does that make any sense? Well, that's unique in these I Ams, and uh, it's perhaps the most clearly relational description we have for genuine Jesus in our series. So Jesus is defining himself then in absolute dynamic relationship to the Father. You don't get a vineyard in nature, you get brambles. You don't get a vineyard without one who propagates it, cares for it, cultivates it. And so it is here. I'm the vine, says Jesus. My Father is the gardener. And here's what we do, says Jesus. I do the sustenance. He does the pruning. And here's where you want something. So it's relational, not just in one dimension, but two. Jesus saying, I'm the vine. Now that brings with it a vine dresser. I want a better expression. I don't know what the English for vine dresser is. I think we've got a proper word for it because we haven't had vineyards very much. The French have probably got a word for it. But also, says Jesus, there's, there's you, there's the branches. And the whole thing fits and works together. Here's, here's how it works. Now, please be careful here. Yeah? There's a clear hint as to what is and isn't being said. Jesus is not saying, I'm the vine. Notice that? He's saying, I'm the true vine. There is lots in the New Testament about vines and vineyards. There's yards of it in the parables. Okay, Matthew 21, 23 following. Two sons set out to work in the vineyard. One said, yeah, I'm going. Didn't go. One said, no, I'm not going. And did. And then you get the bit about the tenants in the vineyard. Mark 12 has got the parable of the tenants. Luke 20 has got the parable of the tenants again. Uh, Matthew 20 has got the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Matthew 21, those two sons again. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they said. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, the religious leaders. There's the context. But John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So there's the sort of background to all this. What's going on when he's talking about being the true vine? Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, went to look for fruit in it, didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry. How long has he been? Three years. Look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Now, these parables give sort of vineyard and vine background in the New Testament. They've got two things in common. They've all got a narrative plot, there's a story. And secondly, in each case, the vineyard, or the people connected with it, they represent Israel, or a part of Israel, which is being far less fruitful than it should have been. And Jesus is not saying, I'm the vine, he's saying, I'm the true vine, against that sort of background. Do you see the point? Those New Testament parables refer, refer to first century Israel as the diseased or untrue vine. And Jesus is saying, historic Israel is the untrue vine. I am the true vine. And he's taking them back to the Old Testament teaching about what the vine is, or should be, or was meant to be, in the eternal plan and purpose of God. And he's making the enormous statement that the true vine, the true Israel, is standing in front of them, Carrying the name of Jesus. I am it, he says. See, in the Old Testament, the vine is a common symbol for Israel, the covenant historic people of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine. Most remarkable, again, though, is, is that whenever historic Israel gets referred to under this figure of speech, it is the vine's failure to produce fruit that is emphasized. The existing vine, 
is not bearing fruit. And that's Old Testament as well as New. And in contrast to that failure, Jesus now says, I am the true vine. That's huge, isn't it? I am the one to whom Israel pointed, the one that brings forth good fruit for God. I am the new root from Jesse's stump in Isaiah's language, which is the real deal for Israel. Now in John's Gospel already, Jesus has shown that he supersedes the temple. He's shown that he supersedes the Jewish feasts and Moses. And here he supersedes even the old covenant people of God as the identification of the true people of God. I am the true vine. And in contrast to centuries of Israel's failure, Jesus claims, I am true vine. To whom Israel point? The one who brings forth good fruit for God. How much is he saying? He's saying a lot for me. I am the true God. Perhaps the most important single reference to this theological theme in the Old Testament is um, Psalm 80. Psalm 80. <clears throat> Some extracts here. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You fed them with the bread of tears. You've made them drink tears by the bowlful. You've made us a source of contention to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. What did God bring out of Egypt? A vine. Yeah, but in history terms, go back to the Old Testament. What people? Moses and the Jewish people, wasn't it? So he's saying, the psalmist is saying, look, I'm thinking of those Old Testament people of God who came out of Egypt, right? God's people coming out of Egypt. I'm thinking of them as the vine. I brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations, you planted it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see, watch over this vine. Vines need tending. The root your right hand has planted, the sun you've raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire, and your rebuke, your people perish. Now what about this funny next bit in verse 17? There's a man at God's right hand. Listen to what it says. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you raised up for yourself. What, um, what's this about hands in the Old Testament, Colin? Shall I give you a clue? Yeah. Ah, uh, there's a question. I keep talking about that. Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, there's this blind person. Jacob, Jacob. blessed Joseph's sons, didn't he? Yeah. And what did he do? He crossed his hands over, so he had blessed the longer one. Yeah. With yeah. One yeah. blessed. Yeah. Is the older one meant to have? But what he did with his hand, he put his him. hand on him to bless him, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. There were two different blessings, but his hand on to bless and saying let your hand rest on the man at your right hand let your blessing be on who's how do you describe there in the rest of that verse verse 17 the son of man you've raised up for you for himself for yourself then we'll not turn away from you revive us and we'll call on your name god bless that one that son of man and he's going to be divine restore us O lord God Almighty, make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. Jesus says, this is me. I am the true vine. The true vine, then, is not the wandering people who look like Israel, look like a vine, but do not bear fruit for God, because by definition, the vine bears fruit for God. The true vine is Jesus himself and the people who are grafted into him who bring forth that fruit for God. Now that's how it works with vines, Caleb. You have a rootstock and onto that there's grafting. What's grafting? Um, so when you cut the... You've got the stump of the tree, got the trunk, okay? Oh, and, you cut and what that's good at, that's really good at putting lots of nutrients into the branches, but the branches don't grow very good grapes perhaps. So they're cut off and new ones are grafted in, cut in the side and all wrapped up so it grows. These cuttings are put on the side and they grow off this really efficient rootstock. It gets lots of food, but then they grow nice grapes. 
Make sense? Different varieties go to different things. Jesus is the true vine, and there are people grafted into him to bring forth fruit for God. A few things follow from that. Firstly, a command and a promise that comes to us in the voice of God. The vine says this, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Did you get that? Yeah. Remain in me, says Jesus, and I will remain in you. Because those graftings haven't got roots of their own. It's the rootstock that's got the roots and gets the energy out of the soil to put into the fruit growing. Is that making sense? You've got the picture in your head now. It's an invitation. Remain in me, I'll remain in you. And a command, and it carries consequences of very great seriousness. Not least for those Jews who were listening in the first century as Jesus is teaching this gospel. That, that this gospel actually in John seems to have been written for. Hear the spell that consequences for everybody. If Jesus is the true vine, and he's saying, remain in me, and I will remain in you, the consequences are stay in and produce fruit. Without the vine, you can produce nothing. Because you've got no roots of your own. If you don't remain in, you wither, you drop off, and you're picked up and burned in the fire. Because that's what happens with branches in that situation. If the graft fails or whatever. By the end of this, then, we're, we're dealing with a person who wanders in the vineyard, caring for it, picking up withered branches and burning them so their decay doesn't disease the remaining branches. And that's who genuine Jesus is. He's the rootstock. And his father is the...